I'm going to talk a little bit about making care better. And yeah, I'm a pediatric spine surgeon. I, I take care of a couple hundred kids a year who have complex spine deformity. But really, what I see as my sort of job in this back nine is to make care better for kids with spine deformity and patients with orthopedic problems, and to the extent that I can, to do better at what we do. Um, in fact, we uh, just had a book uh, signed up by Simon & Schuster called Sharpening Your Scalpel that I've been working on for four or five years that's really about getting better. And that's what this talk is about, getting better as a surgeon, getting better as a physician, but also as a spouse, as a colleague, as a friend, and I uh, hope you sort of feel some of that in this talk today. So, uh, disclosures, lots of stuff. I do lots of research and I'm on a bunch of boards, none of which I think is really relevant right now. The real disclosure is as someone who takes care of lots of complex, <coughs> sick, fragile kids with bad problems, I've had a bunch of complications over 23 years and I hate them. It's, uh, it's a terrible thing. Um, and it's made me sort of think, how can I avoid them? That's really what this talk is about. These are some complications that, uh, that happen in pediatric spine surgery, bad things. So the framing question is, how will the next patient be harmed? Because that's what happens. Patients come into you and they seem like beautiful little kids, but really what they are is a hand grenade. Something's about to happen. And you have to figure out how to stop that. And how far will you be willing to go to prevent that harm? So I'm going to really speak about four things. I'm going to make an analogy with uh, aviation and maritime history. Why are we here? Because the reality is I've had a couple uh, family members in the hospital over the years. And when you have that intimate connection as a user, as a customer, as a patient, you realize the chaos that's within our healthcare systems. It's really not a safe place. And it's also not safe to trust any single human being. We're all fallible. In fact, human beings make errors at a rate of about one in 100. So if I see 100 kids a week, I'm going to make some mistakes if I only rely on my own intuition. And that's where the systems approach comes in. I'm going to speak a little bit about how the systems approach really changed aviation. It allowed you to the confidence to get on an airplane, which maybe you would not have done uh, before we started thinking in systems. And finally, I'm going to speak about um, <clears throat> confronting hierarchy because ego is the enemy. And one of the big problems in our healthcare system is uh, our sort of broken culture and this notion that I'm the captain of the ship. Uh, and these things are the things that get us out of trouble. But, so I read basically everything that I can on aviation disasters. And this is the story of <clears throat> uh, a crash uh, that uh, in 2009 where um, the pilots were leaving Brazil and going to France, Air France. And if you read the story, which is uh, really well covered in Vanity Fair, it's a fascinating story. It tells the story of a pilot recently divorced, spending the weekend in Rio de Janeiro with his girlfriend, and another pilot who's a young pilot who hadn't had a lot of aviation practical experience. This is one of the problems right now, is everything's computerized, right? This morning I said, go to Greenwich Hospital, but I really wasn't paying attention to what turns I needed to make. And that's what's happening in aviation. There's very little airmanship happening. And it tells the story of technical problems. One of the uh, speed recorders was malfunctioning. Human error, that young pilot uh, thought that the speed recorder was correct and kept on ascending kept on going slower, higher, uh, when he should not have. Um, the checklist was telling him, get airspeed. He was ignoring it. The senior pilot was in the back, broken teamwork, broken culture. Senior pilot comes in the front of the plane, flight recorder records an argument between the two. One thinks that the plane is going too fast, the other thinks the plane is going too slow. 290 people died, they found the the black box uh, later. Same thing happened in this. Biggest problem in maritime history of late. And what happens is the same thing. It's productivity pressures. This particular pilot on this boat had been late for his previous three deliveries. Can't be late again. 
despite the fact that a massive hurricane is flashing through the Caribbean. Co-pilots saying, I think we need to get to port, this is going to be a problem. Senior pilot saying, leave me alone, I'm going to sleep. The clock is ticking. NTSB, after all these people died, says, as is usually the case, the catastrophe was unfolding because of a combination of factors that had aligned, which included issues with authority culture, productivity pressures, technical mistakes, bad judgment. That sound familiar? This is our healthcare system. This is the stuff of tragedy that can never be completely explained. But I like what they said here. They said, the most important thing to remember is that 33 people lost their lives in this tragedy. And if these recommendations are adopted, the safety recommendations in our report will improve safety of life at sea. See, we're good at learning mistakes in aviation and maritime. We're bad in healthcare. And that's what um, I'm going to speak a little bit about. And Matthew Syed, one of my favorite books in this sort of space of safety, speaks um, about black box thinking, about how we're really good at understanding the black box and not making the mistakes over and over and over in aviation, and we're really bad in healthcare. A failure to learn from mistakes has been one of the single greatest obstacles to human progress. We must invest in systems and cultures that enable organizations to learn from errors. And again, we're bad at that. Which brings me to this patient of mine, Adelina. She's a nine-year-old. This is a typical patient in my practice. Myotonic dystrophy, beautiful little kid. I operate her on her very early. She's got about 100 degrees scoliosis at the age of two. I put in what are called uh, vectors or growing rods. And she does okay for a while until she gets to nine years old. Spinal deformity progresses to the point that she gets breakdown between her ear and her shoulder. Her, her alignment is so bad, I can no longer control it. So she's got this terrible head tilt. <clears throat> I say I have to take this on. But she's a complex kid. Besides being, um, you know, having complex spine problems, she has a lot of other medical problems. And this is her sort of surgical history. She's had 10 procedures over time. So I take her to the operating room. I have, this is 2009. This is one of the cases that sort of changed the way I think about my obligation to take care of kids. So I have a second year resident assisting. So I'm really lucky. I'm in this huge academic medical center with lots of help, but I have an untrained, unqualified, maybe uninterested resident helping me in this super complex kid. Make an incision. She becomes hypotensive after the incision. She's got myotonic dystrophy. The muscles in her vessels don't work normally. I should have understood that, right? Uh, really hypotensive. I'm doing things and now she's they're having trouble keeping her blood pressure up during the operation. I know I need to stop the operation, but I'm doing an osteotomy, loosening up the spine. And during the course of doing the, uh, the osteotomy, I get a CSF leak. That means the cerebral spinal fluid is leaking. Normally, I can repair that. There's all sorts of things I can do, but I don't have time. I need to get out of the operating room. I leave the operating room like this. Just a few uh, screws in. I get her into the ICU. She's alive. I have an incredible team, they're resuscitating her, but she gets a um, CSF leak, an infected leak of cerebral spinal fluid. This is like 50% mortality problem in this nine-year-old now. Uh, so she's in the ICU for seven weeks. Hospital reminds me that we spent a million dollars on her care, eight surgeries. I have all sorts of skilled people in my place, neurosurgeons, uh, intensivists, and we get her through it. But it makes me understand, what did I do wrong here? It wasn't purely a technical mistake. I got into CSF, I, I had a problem that was technical, but I didn't appreciate the host. I didn't appreciate what I was doing. I made mistakes around communication. I made mistakes around uh, planning. And this is a so-called uh, Ishikaza diagram or, or fishbone diagram, which we insist on using for all of our M&Ms because it's never about purely the technical problem. It's about protecting people with a combination of systems, culture, communication, and technical. And I get her through it. I get back. I instrument her. I'm in touch with this kid all the time. But uh, it was a wake-up call to me that we need to do better than this because we're all at risk. I love the quote from Gawande, the important question isn't how to keep bad 
physicians, nurses, therapists from harming patients. It's how to good, keep good ones from harming patients. And uh, this is probably my second favorite book in this space, uh, Complications by Gwande. And there's a lot at stake. Uh, the worst story <clears throat> is the story of an ophthalmologist who has a general surgeon <clears throat> come to him because he has cancer in his eye. And the general surgeon says, can you help me? And the ophthalmologist says, yeah, but we need to enucleate your eye, but you'll still have you know, monoocular vision, probably still be able to practice. Seattle, 2014, ophthalmologist enucleates the wrong eye. General surgeon is done with practice. Ophthalmologist kills himself as a result. So there's a lot at stake here, right? And I'll say to you, how will the next patient be harmed and how far will you be willing to go to avoid that? So I'm going to speak a little bit about the science of patient safety. Um, there's sort of three types of complications. The idiosyncratic complications, and those are almost always what people say, I can't believe this happened, so one in a million thing. That's nonsense. It's really unusual that you have this idiosyncratic complication. Almost always, your complications are a result of sharp edge errors, I cut the nerve, or more likely, systems problems. Problems with culture, communication, not understanding your patient. And modern day thinking about patient error uh, uses this Swiss cheese model, which says that even if one person makes a mistake, in order for you to operate on the wrong patient, you need to do a number of, a number of things need to go wrong. And patient safety is about putting blocks in front of human error so that the errors that we make don't get propagated to the patient. This is the example for COVID. So COVID happens, and there's things that we can do that are imperfect that can stop it, um, including masking, including vaccinations, including social distancing. But if you put all these things in front of each other, you're much more likely to transmit to patient harm. And the problem is ego. How are my brother's surgical skills? What would you say? <laughs> Pretty good, but the problem is, that's what we would all say about ourselves. If, if, if you ask a surgeon, how are you? Everyone says, you know, I've been doing this for 23 years. I'm the best that there is. But the reality is, that's not the real question. The real question is, how good are your surgical outcomes? And those two things are only loosely related. There's a threshold effect where you need to be good enough to get in the room. But then what I will um, argue to you is your real outcomes are more dependent on this. We overemphasize the space between the red lines, the cutting event, right? I cut and I close. That's a little bit of, of the value that I bring to patients. The real value is part of the ecosystem of care that you're all involved in. It's do I understand the risk that this patient is presenting to me? Can I dose the amount of surgery? Maybe this isn't a patient who needs this surgery. They need this surgery. Um, how can I optimize their care? How can I drive the system? How can I drive culture? How can I develop a team that is better than me alone? And I think that's one of the mistakes that we make in healthcare. It's not just about the knife, it's about all of these things. So these are three surgeons here. The best surgeon in blue had incredible technique. In 23 years, I'm the vice chair of my our group right now, so sometimes we need to do some hard things. That's the only surgeon I had to let go. Extremely good technical surgeon, terrible communicator. Patient safety issues, communication problems, lawsuits, uh, outcomes, miserable. Doing the wrong surgery, not communicating, not taking care of patients. Again, it's not just about the knife, it's a combination of your technical skill, your planning, infrastructure, and your team. And again, this is the Ishikawa diagram. And you know, when our residents present cases, I basically don't want to see an x-ray. I want to know what went wrong in terms of communication and systems and what you're going to do differently. I don't want to, I don't want to hear that the screws went in perfectly because that's never the root cause of the problem. And that's what this technique called five wise thinking tells you about. 
it makes you think about what really happened, what's the real cause of the error, because we're often too quick to jump to judgment. This is, as you guys may uh, recognize, the Washington Monument. And the Washington Monument had a big problem. It was disintegrating. The facade of the monument was disappearing. And why was that happening? People started looking into it. The chemicals that we're using were these terrible, terrible chemicals. They just started using them. So maybe you have the answer to the problem, right? Maybe that's why the problem is happening, but not really. They were using the chemicals to clean pigeon poop. But why is there so much pigeon poop all of a sudden? Because there's lots of spiders all of a sudden, that, and the pigeons are being attracted to the spiders. But really, that's a result of all the gnats that all of a sudden started popping up. <laughs> the gnats were there because they changed the lighting structure of the Washington Monument. They started lighting it fluorescently at night that attracted gnats, that attracted spiders, that attracted pigeons, that created the use of harsh chemicals that disintegrated the Washington Monument. And that's how you need to think of complications and problems, root cause analysis. So turn the lights off. Don't change your chemicals. I'm gonna speak about five things over the next 30 minutes. I'm gonna speak about variability and the poison of variability in our healthcare system. I'm gonna speak about our chaotic healthcare environment. I'm gonna speak about the power of group decision making, the power of data to uh, improve care, and finally, culture. I'll speak a little bit about each of these. So six years ago, I had the um, pleasure and opportunity to recruit three world-leading spine surgeons to my group. Lenke, Rue, and Lehman, amazing people. Top of their field from St. Louis. And when they came over, we had a discussion. And I'd been, at that point, doing what I do for 17 years. And one of them said to me, well, I, I'd like to put vancomycin in our, uh, our uh, incisions before we close. High dose of an local antibiotics, decreased rates of infection. And one of them said to me, well, I don't like to use vancomycin. I like to use gentamicin, different gram-negative drug, because this is this. And the truth is there's no evidence supporting one or the other. So I was uncomfortable with it because I know that standardization helps, but you can't tell another surgeon what to do. So we were okay for about 14 months. And then one day, the nurse gave the dose of local de antibiotics, dump in tons of local antibiotics, right, to the anesthesiologist instead of to the surgeon, instead of to the scrub nurse. Mm -hmm. So now, patient gets 40 times dose of gentamicin, knocks off their kidneys, acute kidney failure. What's the root cause of the problem? It's not gentamicin, it's variability. Every time you take variability out of care, every time you standardize care, you make care safer. Variability is the problem. And people speak about this in sports as well. It's this concept of automaticity, flow, that if you're a golfer, if you're a free shoot thrower, thrower you have a routine. Your pre-shot routine improves your performance. And people speak about this. Do it the same way every time. Chunk the pieces of your performance that should be on automatic so you have cognitive ability to pay attention to the parts that are important. And some people say, well, I don't control my environment the way a free throw shooter does. And I, I sort of argue with that. I don't think that's really right. Coach Wooden, right, winningest basketball coach in history. People speak about how Wooden's teams consistently outperformed the skill set on his team. And he writes an article about, in um, Newsweek, about how to put on your socks. Infamous that if you don't play by his rules, put on your socks the same way, the same way I demand my team to do every time, you don't play on my team, I don't care. He says the most important part of your equipment is your shoes and socks, it's the little things that count. What's he really saying? He's saying, pay attention to the little things. I think about this in my OR. My OR starts with the tape that goes on my mask that stops my loops from fogging up so that that part of the thing is just a non-issue. 
and on and on and on and on. It's the same thing when you're prepping a patient. You can standardize that so that there's no variability anymore. It's the same thing in my OR. I'm not there when they're setting up the room because I have a piece of tape in the room and they know that every single time the front right wheel of the operating bed needs to go on that piece of tape. That's optimized so that the x-ray machine can fit in perfectly. It's optimized so that the lights in my room, which have a yellow mark on them, all line up perfectly, focusing on the table that's on the tape because I'm chunking that part of the performance that is, should be automatic. Then I can concentrate on the things that really matter. I get to operate since 2009 with an advanced pediatric spine fellow. That means my fellow has done a previous spine fellowship. These are people who have been trained for nine years who are basically fully trained spine surgeons who are assisting me because I'm taking care of fragile kids. Why would I not do that? We'll speak a little bit about chaos in our healthcare system. And again, the lesson from aviation is really strong. Does anyone know what this plane was? This is the so-called Flying Fortress. This was the plane that was supposed to win World War II by delivering more armament to Nazi Germany than ever before. First 13 test pilots died. Unflyable. Too much plane to handle. Uh, and uh, people said, you're never going to be able to fly a plane this complicated. What were they not doing? They didn't have tape on the floor. They weren't chunking their performance. There were parts of the pre-flight routine that could have been on automatic. And in fact, a number of pilots said, let's think about this a little bit. This is the beginning of checklists. Checklists came from the Flying Fortress, aviation history. Now, checklists allow pilots to do things that we would never have been able to do if we were just relying on skill and intuition, right? Ultimately, because of a checklist, not because of skill, not because of technology, the Boeing 299 was able to have a big part in winning the war. 13,000 missions over Nazi Germany because of the checklist. So we are a checklist culture of my place. People make fun of me. I was in Singapore three days ago sharing and talking about checklists uh, to uh, Asian Pacific peoples, and they get it. Um, we have checklists for surgeons, we have checklists for nurses, we have checklists for patients. If you come to me as a patient, I give you a checklist and I say, don't let your kid go home without understanding what you need to do with opioids. You understand that? Because if you give your kid too much opioid, something can happen. This is a patient of mine. This is a kid who came in ridiculously uh, 12 days after surgery and the rod slipped out of the right side of the screws. What happened here, Mark? What did I do wrong? Uh, the final torque was missed. Yeah. I do two or three spine surgeries a day. So as I leave one room, I go to the other room, and the fellow forgot to tighten the set screws on the right side of the rod. Crazy. But it only happens once. Because now I'm not allowed to leave the room without checking off, did you final tighten your set screws? All of those things, I'm going to make a mistake about one in a hundred times. So to stop that two sigma error that human beings make, you need a checklist. You need to automate this. And we have very complex checklists. This is the most recent checklist um, that's being used in our ORs. Checklists make care safer. And I would encourage you guys. Great uh, book, again, by Gawande, Checklist Manifesto, who really speaks about all this stuff. Okay, group thinking. Um, so this is a great book called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Surowiecki, and he speaks, opening of the book is about very early times in London. There's a cow in the middle of the square, and they don't have a way of weighing the cow. This is 3,000 years ago. And people emerge as experts saying, I think that cow is worth 30 sheep. But what, they, what people realize is that if you average the decisions of a number of experts, you always do better. And I've done this now uh, at least nine times. I've developed a group, developed a, a group of experts as part of a Delphi process. That, that's formal consensus derivation process. I want to figure out the best way to avoid, for example, infections. And I get a bunch of people together. So I can have a group like this, and I can say to you,
how many marbles are in that jar? And you're looking at it, you're counting, it's 10 high, you're doing some math in your head, you're providing some space for air, and you're gonna, on average, be within about 11% of the right number. But if I average, and I do this every year, all of your guesses on an Excel spreadsheet live, I can always get within 3% by averaging decision making, the power of collective intelligence. And that's what we need to bring to our OR. So we do that in a number of ways. This is our preoperative optimization conference. I present, fellow presents, all of our cases in front of a group of surgeons, nurses, therapists, pediatricians every week. Sometimes we make a, a, a change on that, but that email then gets sent to all of the people that are gonna to touch that patient, 26 people in this week, the next week. So what happens? I'm pre-executing the operation, right? Now I'm telling you, this week we're operating on a kid with myotonic dystrophy, I'm worried about blood pressure, we may need to leave the operating room. It's a pre-shot routine, right? It's, it's uh, visualizing the surgery before you get there. If you're not writing the operative report before the surgery, you're not taking the very best care of your patient. And we actually wrote a paper that showed that about 25% of the time, presenting a patient in a conference like this actually changed my decision in the, two times in the last three weeks. Um, makes a big, big, big difference. Part of that conference, and again, the x-rays in this case are important, but we insist that they present a risk severity score. So we've developed risk severity scores for early onset scoliosis, adolescent scoliosis, neuromuscular scoliosis, CP scoliosis, meaning I can predict the chance of an unplanned return to the operating room. What that allows me to do is optimize the patient, dose the surgery, maybe I don't need to correct all this to form me. Maybe the risk is too high and I need to fuse this kid in situ. Or maybe this isn't a kid I should be operating on. And in fact, that's the case with this kid, Emma. So this is a kid, this is the youngest kid that I put in uh, growing spine uh, instrumentation at the age of one when she was really, really sick on ECMO with congenital diaphragmatic hernia in our ICU. Uh, so I operate on her a whole bunch of times over uh, lots of years. And, but when they come into the office though, what does it look like? It looks like this beautiful kid, this great mom who I've known, and that's what you perceive as a busy clinician in the office, right? You see a kid that you're trying to help, but we're bad at making those decisions. In a busy office, I got 14 people in the waiting room, this kid needs help, I'm not gonna be good at making the decision around optimizing, dosing, saying no. So it looks like a beautiful little kid, but sometimes it's really a hand grenade. And risk severity scores are the things that allow you to differentiate. <clears throat> I'll tell you, if you do any complex surgery, you need to understand that in this particular kid, I have a 42% chance of an unplanned return to the operating room if I'm not really careful. Are you sure are you, sure you know how high my risk severity <laughs> score is? Yes, don't worry, I'm calling in the reinforcements. That means I have three spine surgeons. I have a neurosurgeon. I have a plastic surgeon. She gets a G2 before the operation. I put her in traction. I'm imaging, I'm using navigation. I'm prepared to stage the case. I have the right anesthesiologist in the room. And in fact, we created an app for our risk severity scores, which you, you can get online if you're a spine surgeon, you might find it interesting. But the point is, it's formal structure that allows us to make care better for our patients. Okay, next topic, data. So data is not always data. It turns out that Hawthorne, Pennsylvania um, has a problem in this factory. They're producing steel cables and they're producing them at a low rate. Efficiency is poor, quality is poor. They bring in a group of consultants in. The co what do the consultants say? How do you produce better cable? You turn the lights on. This is the so-called Hawthorne effect. It's the reality that any time you focus attention on an issue, you make care better. And you know, running quality for the department, it's been fun watching how consistently you can do this. You know, right now we're uh, in a project looking at efficiency in uh, arthroplasty care. Just getting a group of people together makes you get into the operating room faster, makes turnover better. 
It's really very simple. It's about turning the lights on. When we had problems with infection, all you need to do is dashboard your antibiotic timing, dosage, and redosage, and people get better. You see from 2019 how abysmal our rates of optimal compliance were? I didn't have to find people, I didn't have to incent people, you just have to show people. Uh, and we're competitive and we get better. And there's all sorts of data. These are pressure injuries, right? If we operate on a kid in a prone position for eight hours, what happens? The good news is that your spine surgery went great. The bad news is that you're gonna have a scar under your eye for the rest of your life. Avoidable, right? Pressure injury. So when this happens, hasn't happened in four years now, a picture gets taken of the patient and sent to everyone that touches the patient. Nurses, medical students, residents, therapists. Makes it really hard the next time you're in the operating room positioning that patient to make the same mistake again. It's data. Data doesn't have to be numbers. So why did I get involved in all this? I shared with you a story. I'll share with you another story. 2008. Uh, so at that point, I was, I was associate chief of the division, uh, and I was the chief of spine surgery, but I had a senior surgeon uh, working with me. Great guy, Dave Roy. You guys may remember David Roy. He's my uh, mentor, boss friend. Um, and we had a slew of infections at the end of that summer. Bad infections. I remember going in August of 2008, uh, operating on a kid who was infected, and the kid coded on me. They become acutely hypotensive from anaphylaxis because of you know, release of endotoxin during the surgery. And I shut down the spine program. And I was relatively junior at that time. Not very popular move. Administration, everyone say, what are you doing? not tolerating a 15% rate of spine infections at Columbia. So what do we do? We developed a new protocol. There's never a single smoking gun. It's not like one person has staph aureus in their ear. It's a bunch of things that we were doing wrong. Um, and uh, we started asking around. In fact, did a study with CHOP and CHLA that showed that in fact, gram negative infections in 2008 were on this huge resurgence. More than half of our infections were gram negatives and we were not prophylacting with gram negative antibiotics. Then we said, what's the standard of care? And we surveyed POSNAM, a national organization, and there was no standard of care. Variability. Variability means some kids are getting harmed. We looked at the literature. The literature was terrible in this space. It was not gonna drive decision making. But you don't need, really need literature. What you need is to decrease variability. And this was the beginning of what are now nine best practice guidelines that we developed around various things. So what does that mean? That means you get a bunch of people in a room, uh, experts, and you formally derive consensus. You make people speak about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what's the evidence, and agree on things. And that resulted in us using gram negatives, perfecting timing and dose. You can see the rest of the things here. Vancomycin powder, plastic surgery closure. This was our infection rate the next year, zero. What does that mean? That means all of this unnecessary, avoidable, iatrogenic harm, right? Isn't that miserable? So we kept our infection rates very, very low, not quite zero to 2008, we follow this. Uh, very, very closely. Um, it's, I'm really proud of it. We speak about it. You know, so again, I was speaking about this in Singapore a couple days ago. I was speaking about it in Rome Monday. Um, and people say, well, this is not science. How, how do you know that these things are the things that decreased infection rates? And I say, I don't care. I've published about 300 articles. That's research. This is quality. Quality means you have a patient who's not sick. I don't need to have a hypothesis. I don't need to have a, a power analysis. I don't need to have an IRB. You make care better by decreasing variability, formally deriving consensus. And that's what we did. I think a lot of this is just turning the lights on, making pay, people pay attention. I get to do this nationally. I run what's called a pediatric spine study group. We just enrolled our 11,000th patient, kid less than 10 years of age with scoliosis. And what we get to do is across these 79 centers around the world, dashboard, whoop, 
dashboard how people are doing because we're all competitive. And if I tell you, you're this guy, that's basically all I need to do to make you better. You will change. This is blood loss during scoliosis surgery. Again, if I tell you where you are on a bell curve, you get better. It's turning the lights on. I love this quote by Brandeis. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. And again, around infection, around surgical error, a lot of it is just turning the lights on. The problem is sustainability. And now that I've been doing this for a while, um, I, I recognize that. So this is what happens. This is our spike in infections in 2008. This is what we did subsequently. And if you look at this statistically, you start to see a pattern. Every time we turn the lights on, develop a best practice guideline, add other types of antibiotics, create a uh, pa patient safety process. Every time you turn the lights on, complications go down, negative outcomes go down, but then there's a drift up again. Uh, and we've actually published about this. This is the, the challenge of sustainability, where you need to keep on changing things up. You need to change your checklist. You need to somehow get people to continue to pay attention. Otherwise, we, we get distracted. We've done this in neurological safety. When you operate on spine, uh, uh, you uh, look at uh, electrophysiological monitoring. And sometimes those monitoring signals in your operating room change. Now this is a, a problem. This is like a stroke to the spinal cord. You're on the clock and you need to fix the thing. And we've all been there before. Spine surgeons understand this. We have informal ways in our brain, but maybe under this incredible pressure, you shouldn't rely on a single individual to make a decision. Um, so we developed a best practice guideline around this as well. And this is uh, one of the best cited papers um, in my field that we uh, published, which is around developing a checklist, a standard response to what happens when an adult or uh, child loses uh, motor remote potentials in your operating room. Because it shouldn't be about an individual person under stress. And these things say things like, <clears throat> talk to the anesthesiologist, shut off the music, get the most senior people in the room. Maybe the most important thing is consider consultation with a colleague. This happens at least once every two weeks in my place because no one's allowed to do spine surgery and lose motor revoke potentials without calling me or another spine surgeon. That can be a quick conversation. It could be, Mike, I lost potentials. I put in the rod uh, a little bit less corrected. The patient seems okay. Is it okay if I continue? Or I'll do the same thing. Because you need a co-pilot when you're under stress in those situations. And we've done this uh, now for <coughs> all sorts of checklists. This is our high-risk spine checklist. This is wrong site spine surgery. So <clears throat> I got together a group called the Spinal Deformity Club of New York, and I said, out of these 14 senior experienced spine surgeons, how many of you have operated on the wrong level? How many out of 14 said, I did? 14. <clears throat> Remember, your human fallibility is about one in 100. So if you've been operating for 30 years, 200 cases a year, do the math. Unless you have a system to stop you, and that's the checklist we created around wrong site surgery. This says things like, did you check that this patient really has 12 ribs and five lumbar vertebrae because 14% of you don't. There's human variability. And if I count 12 ribs on a pre-op x-ray, and then when I'm in the operating room, I'm counting a 13th rib, I'm gonna make a mistake. Um, and so we have all sorts of technical things to avoid this, making sure that we're putting metal on bone, making sure that we understand there's 12 ribs. The most important part is the cultural part. If I say, Mark, that's T12, We've operated before, we've done spine surgery before together. He'll say, yeah, sure, I get it, because I'm two years older than he is. <laughs> <clears throat> but what I need to do is not destroy the culture in the room. The hierarchy, the ego is the enemy. I need to say to my technician, can you take a look at my screws? Tell me what's going on. This is Petrus. He's better than I am at understanding this, because I've enabled, I've entrusted him with making decisions, thinking about this. And generally, we're bad at that. This is a great study. So if you get on a plane like I will do tomorrow and fly internationally, your pilot will have taken the so-called hazardous pilot's, pilots um, uh, uh, questionnaire. This says, if you say things like, 
I believe I can do better without sleep than other people. My decision making is better than yours. You don't get to fly internationally. There's actually a domain on this called macho. And that domain um, makes people need to get culturally retrained. An orthoplasty surgeon gave a bunch of orthoplasty surgeons this exact modified checklist. And what he found is that, again, the domain of macho was associated with reoperations, infections, uh, dislocations, right? Culture. And that's what I'm going to speak about in the last three or four minutes, the importance of culture. So I presented this last week. I flew on Air Korea. And I presented to 2,000 uh, Asia Pacific surgeons. And this is the story of Air Korea. 228 deaths in this particular disaster. Um, and what, what happened here? Anyone remember this? Malcolm Gladwell speaks about this. What do these people die of? Who knows? Cardiopulmonary arrest. Why? Because the plane hit the ground at 900 miles an hour. Why? Because it ran out of gas. Why? It's a culture. Co-pilot on the black box says, in Korean, hierarchical language, junior co-pilot, senior pilot, there are times in certain situations where sometimes some would think about alternative approaches. Land the goddamn plane, we're not going to make it to the airport. You understand? Culture. 228 people died. Culture. It's George Girardi, we're the New York uh, Yankee team doctors, friend Chris Ahmad. And uh, he comes and he speaks and he says, I have the same problem that you have in spine surgery. You're surrounded by a group of elite performers. Ego is the enemy. Ego is the biggest obstacle. All right, here's a layup. I'm feeling sort of among the older people in this crowd. Who remembers this? What did these people die of? Terry McAuliffe, only teacher in space to die. What did they die of? Cardiopulmonary arrest. Why? Space shuttle exploded. The aorta's burst. Why? O-ring. 18 emails that weekend. Shuttle hadn't flown in nine months. Productivity pressures. 18 emails. Shuttle cannot fly. Engineers knew it was going to blow up. Someone in your OR knows you're about to enucleate the wrong eye. Don't fly. Ignored. What do they die of? Culture. The fix to this isn't a different O-ring. It's cultural transformation. It's fixing the broken safety culture of the organization. Right? And this almost closed the entire uh, uh, space shuttle program in NASA at the time. Now, there's one person gets to stop the line. Anyone can stop the shuttle from launching that day. And that's how it should be, right? If I'm about to do the wrong thing in the operating room, I need a culture that allows, that stops me from, protects me from myself. Because ultimately, I don't care. You know, this spine surgeon that we had to let go is no longer practicing, and he's one of the best people at putting a screw in a certain part of the body that I know. But he's an unsafe surgeon because of culture. Without a well-functioning team, neither skill nor technology will stop the plane from crashing. And the problem is, we're really not very good at this. If I ask attending surgeons how you do, teamwork level felt to be high. Mark, how's the teamwork in your OR? Every surgeon says, great. If I ask the nurse, lousy. It's not a good team player. <laughs> And if you're flying in a plane, belief that the decisions of the leader should be questioned. That's true. The, the pilots say, question me. I'm human. Maybe I'm making the wrong decision. Maybe you're right. The air speed monitor is defective. That's the person I want to fly with, right? Not the surgeon who says, I've been doing this for 23 years. You know who you're talking to? No one does as much spine surgery as I do. Who do you want to fly with? 
So I run something called the Spine Safety Summit, and we brought General Stanley McChrystal uh, in, and this guy's a great guy. I've learned so much from this guy. One of the uh, one of the things I asked as part of his visit was that I get to spend two hours with him. Uh, really incredible, high-performing person who was brought in because of the amount of suicides, the amount of deaths related to IEDs in the Middle East. He took over JSOC, their entire uh, Middle East strategy, and basically turned it around uh, because of culture. He writes a book called Team of Teams, which is about winning the war with teamwork and culture rather than weapons. And really brilliant guy, I brought him to Spine Safety Summit, again, uh, fascinating, fascinating human being. He now sort of runs a consultancy firm on this. Um, and what he says is, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. My job is not to be the smartest person in the room, to be the best technician in the room. My job is to be a conductor you know, I'm surrounded by this incredible talent in my place. These are all the people that get to touch kids with spine surgery, who need spine surgery. And I think that I'm doing that because I'm technically the best. I can never optimize my outcome to my patients. If I'm a conductor that's trying to connect neurosurgeons, plastic surgeons, my incredible nurses, our therapists, I'm gonna do better. And I look at this in lots of ways. Uh, Peter Pro Protovost um, from Hopkins speaks about this process called CUSP, a Cons Comprehensive Unit Safety-Based Program. And we use this basically in everything that we do. If someone comes to me a prop with a problem, we have too many PEs on the arthroplasty service, I create a CUSP process. I, I create a group of people who meet prior to surgery, we delay our surgeries for an hour or two in the morning, once every six weeks. The nurses, the therapists, the uh, inpatient people, the social workers speak about the problem. Every single time, care gets better. It's sort of cheating. It's ridiculous how easy it is to do this stuff. And I've done this you know, 10 or 15 times now. Um, this is communication in the OR. So we keep track of when the patient goes in the room, and then everyone gets an email saying, this week we did a great job. I want to congratulate the anesthesia time. This is the seventh time in a row that you got in the room by 7.30. Um, but we did have a problem with neurophysiology or something like that. When you do that, care always gets better. These are our uh, incision times over three years during the course of this process. And we've been able to sustain change like this. So I'm just gonna finish up now in the next two or three minutes. And I'm gonna ask the question, how are we doing? We started off saying we're trying to make care better. Um, and I'll tell you, we're not doing really well. Um, second biggest cause of harm in this country is iatrogenic medical error. You go into a hospital, first biggest cause of death is heart disease, second biggest cause of death is I'm gonna make a mistake. And Syed, again, in black box thinking, says you gotta learn from the mistakes of others, right? It drives me crazy where I have an M&M &M and then six months later the same problem happens. I love what Sully says. Yeah. Everything we know, every rule in the book, we know because somewhere, someone has died. We have purchased at great cost, lessons literally learned with blood. We cannot have the moral failure of forgetting these lessons and having to relearn them. But we do. Bloodletting. This has been going on for 2,000 years before we abolished it, right? It originated in third century BC. Do you know George Washington had nine units of blood drawn from him? when he had what was probably a respiratory virus, cause of death. 2,000 years, how slow are we to learn? Spine surgery, it's a big problem. We have ambulatory surgery centers where complex spine surgery is being done. This is um, a patient, 58-year-old, two-level cervical disc replacement, Washington, D.C., asphyxiates in the recovery room of the surgery center because of an airway problem. Four months later, same thing happens to this highly publicized 14-year-old. Two years ago, my hospital, patient gets into the same problem, has to, be, has to get a trach emergently in the middle of the night. We're bad at learning from previous mistakes. And we need to get better at getting better. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got, says Henry Ford. And I'll ask you, how will the next patient be harmed and how far will you be willing to go to prevent that? You have to change. We took an oath that says we're here 
to do no harm. And you can't always do that. But I love the second part of the oath, which says, if I don't violate this, I'm going to live a life respected um, and uh, I'll have a long career helping people. And I'll finally finish with this last slide by Don Berwick. And I love what he says. He says, it's about invis invisible patients that you get to make better. And though they are unknown, we will know that mothers and fathers are at graduations and weddings they would have missed grandchildren and grandparents they might have never known. Holidays will be taken, work completed, books read, symphonies heard, gardens tended that without your work would have never been. I think that's really powerful. Thanks very much for inviting me here.